as Mark said, I'm just going to give a, a, a brief update uh, of the work that we've been doing, but maybe with a slightly different uh, uh, spin on it um, today. Um, and I really want to talk not just about what we've been doing and the sort of the progress we've been making on the trial, but also how we've been able to make that progress. And it's through collaboration from lots and lots of different people, uh, including the many investigators, several of you are in the room here uh, at the various sites, uh, but also with our partners in, in the grant. And that really is uh, the Chiari and Syringa Myelia Foundation and Caitlin and Dorothy and everybody that really have contributed in real and significant ways. And um, so I'd like to, of course, thank you all for that, but also to kind of really talk about it as almost a unique new direction in how research can be done. Um, so with that in mind, I'm just going to sort of remind you without getting into the nuts and bolts, since everybody here is already an expert in this, that there are really um, two very broadly classified different operative techniques to treat Chiari malformation, um, the posterior fossa decompression with or without duraplasty. And again, I'm not going to go too much into this other than to say this is the main question uh, of the uh, award that we're uh, now um, uh, conducting. Um, and of course this, uh, this question about whether or not to perform a duroplasty has been around for any number of years and has been studied um, through meta-analyses, this one from Susan Durham's group in 2008 and then uh, more recently uh, and just uh, last year, and, and really these meta-analyses really demonstrate that uh, posterior fossa decompression um, with dur duroplasty uh, uh, certainly seems to have a higher rate of neurological complication, uh, CSF leak, pseudomeningocele, aseptic meningitis, and longer OR times, but on the other hand, it seems to perhaps have a higher rate of, of uh, clinical improvement. Um, but when we really drill down on this data, and this is a, um, a, a paper by uh, Todd Hankinson from his uh, fellowship year, and really um, all the, the data that we have in these meta-analyses are uh, really um, class two and class three data, and, and this is just a paper from uh, David Daniels last year that really said that, uh, that the data, the quality that we have uh, to help inform these decisions is really, again, class three data for the most part. Uh, and that uh, a clinical trial is necessary to, to really look at this question in a, in a real and uh, robust way. So uh, as all of you know, uh, we uh, uh, several years back formed a, a research consortium across North America, uh, initially with uh, philanthropic funding, and uh, this is uh, called the Park Reeves Syringomyelia Research Consortium. And uh, this really allowed us to collect data both on patients who'd been treated before and those being treated uh, uh, prospectively, so ambuspective enrollment, um, and really to make some observations about a number of different issues, not just this question about whether or not the dura should be opened, uh, but many, many different questions, and, and some of those that uh, have been uh, touched on here today and uh, in previous meetings of this group. Uh, but really, uh, one of the things about this uh, Park Reeves Consortium is that it, it really set up the infrastructure onto which we could piggyback clinical trials. And, and that's really what we did is back in 2015 into 2016, we applied uh, to uh, PCORI, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research, Research Institute, uh, for a trial um, using the backbone of Park Reeves to test this uh, question about whether duraplasty was necessary in the surgical decompression of, of Chiari malformation, specifically in our patient population with syringomyelia. And uh, the study was, before we submitted it, endorsed by uh, the AANS, uh, the CNS, uh, the Joint Section for, for Pediatrics, uh, and we had um, uh, uh, various patient partners. And what I mean by that, and sometimes I may use these terms, and uh, they sort of roll off the tongue because I use them all the time, but uh, they may not be familiar to everyone. So patient partners uh, in, the, in the eyes of PCORI really is um, bringing literal patients or their families onto the research team to help us understand what's important in terms of uh, surgical outcomes and, and what that means, and I'll come back to that in just a bit. The other patient partner that we think about are advocacy organizations and um, of course uh, Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation has been 
the most involved and has been really a fantastic partner uh, and uh, uh, amongst uh, uh, a couple of others as well, which I'll uh, talk about in just a moment. Um, and really, this trial uh, at the time started with the infrastructure of 36 Park Reeve centers. And in order to achieve statistical power, we added an additional cohort of centers as well. So at present, 41 centers are involved in enrolling patients in this. And really, the idea, of course, is to uh, identify the surgical approach, whether it's PFD or PFDD with the duraplasty, that minimizes surgical complications and harm to patients, maximizes symptomatic relief uh, in syrinx resolution, and provides the highest quality of life. Um, and Really, the whole uh, nature and impact of this project is to, to get us away from that uh, you know, the class three data to high level, high quality data to enable us to make good decisions ourselves as caregivers and to inform our patients uh, with really high quality, uh, quality data so they can participate in their own um, healthcare decisions. Here's a, a listing of the, the centers that are participating. Um, again, many of you in the room are on this list, and uh, for that, thank you very much for everything you've done to support the trial. Um, just to review very quickly, um, just the specific aims, three specific aims. One was to determine uh, if posterior faucet decompression is associated with few, fewer surgical complications uh, than PFDD. Um, and we were looking at uh, surgical complications less than or equal to 12 months, um, and these are most often related to uh, CSF disturbances um, and uh, the requirement for additional surgery to help manage these complications. Specific aim two is to look at whether PFD provided non-inferior improvement to, in syrinx resolution uh, or regression compared with PFDD. And here we're looking at clinical symptoms neurological exam findings and function, syrinx regression at 12 months, um, and uh, we're, it's a non-inferiority aim uh, rather than a superiority aim. Uh, and that impacts the way the analysis and the statistics are all calculated. Um, spinal deformity is also one of the outcomes in, in AIM-2. And then AIM-3 is quality of life. So uh, really the question is, uh, with fewer surgical uh, complications, will PFD be associated with superior quality of life or not? Uh, this, is the, um, this, is, this is the question we're trying to answer because this is the final arbiter of, uh, of what is the best operation or if there is a best operation. And the patients who are included are those that are uh, less than or equal to 21 years of age. Um, we um, uh, used a five millimeter of tonsillar uh, ectopia um, uh, uh, cutoff for the trial. I know that's a controversial issue, but that we had to set the cutoff at, at, uh, at some point, so we chose that. Uh, and uh, syrinx. And all the patients have syringomyelia, and they all are in the range of three to 9.9 .9 millimeters. So less than or less than um, uh, 10 millimeters of syringomyelia, yet more than three. Exclusion criteria you see here, basal invagination, clival canal angle less than 120, uh, prior surgery, uh, and patients who don't want to participate. We use standard metrics as our initial outcomes uh, in terms of radiological outcomes, uh, syrinx diameter and length, uh, PBC2, clival canal angle, um, and uh, FOR, and if available, CSF uh, uh, flow studies, that's the CINE study, or TRUE-FISP, which is a dynamic pulsatility study. Uh, but really, we're focusing on syrinx size um, uh, and uh, the uh, craniovertebral junction parameters. Again, you know, one of the things that has uh, become clear over time is that, that up till recently, uh, we've been really studying this intensely, but not using quality of life. In fact, uh, when we looked back at uh, how people were reporting outcomes, almost all papers res uh, really uh, reported a gestalt of the clinician. Was the gestalt of the clinician that the patient was improved or not? Uh, a few papers used standardized scales like the SF scales, uh, and some used a very specific Chiari or disease-specific uh, rating scale, but for the most part, most people were reporting gestalt outcomes. So for the purposes of this trial, we uh, are using the CHIP, which is the Chiari Health Index for Pediatrics, which is developed by our collaborators in Vanderbilt. 
uh, and the Huey 3, which is uh, a, a generic uh, health outcomes utility score. Um, so by using a disease specific and a more broad uh, uh, health index, um, we're judging um, quality of life. And this I know you won't be able to read in any details. This is just the workflow of the study uh, from identification and screening all the way through follow-up. Um, but it's all very scripted. Um, and we did have some early challenges. Uh, so one of the things is that af after we'd actually drawn our protocol and uh, we were funded and getting ready to start, um, one of the investigators brought up the fact that if we uh, stayed with our initial syrinx guidelines, which were three to six millimeters, that the applicability of our results uh, might be limited. In other words, they would not be generalizable. On the other hand, if we enrolled every patient with a syrinx up to 14 millimeters, we felt like there wouldn't be equipoise among clinicians in being able to offer PFD versus PFDD. Um, so we uh, sent out a survey using REDCap and uh, the consensus among the group was that uh, this uh, syrinx diameter of three to nine millimeters was a reasonable, reasonable and prudent uh, level of syringomyelia uh, to include in this study. Um, one of the other things that caused a significant delay at the outset was um, a central IRB. Now I know that many of you are familiar, are familiar with this concept of a central IRB. But really what it is is that one organization, in this case our Washington University, uh, took the lead and created a master reliance agreement. And that is sent through the legal departments and the human and research protection offices of every institution. And they work for months and months to negotiate the details of this. Uh, and they can choose to accept it or not accept it. Now when we first applied for this, uh, the uh, PCORI reviewers, we did not have a central IRB. We had a sort of a functional institution to institution IRB, but PCORI had uh, really felt uh, that we should uh, uh, bring a central IRB on for rapid dissemination of addenda and these sorts of things. And so we did do that, but that uh, took about six months to create and get the master reliance agreements approved at each one of the individual institutions. But even now, about, uh, I think it's 13 of our 41 sites don't use this central IRB. They use either their own local one or maybe they use a commercial one like Western IRB. So it is still somewhat uh, assembled um, with uh, various different routes for IRB. But uh, this did create a little bit of a delay. And especially what we saw was that we had a delay in uh, how patients were being screened and enrolled based on what essentially amounted to an IRB delay. The other early challenge that we faced was right after we got funded and we were starting to, to uh, um, uh, promote the trial, and again, part of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, uh, PCORI, they really, uh, are, they really support uh, a broad representation in the investigator panel of uh, patients, patient partners, and then patient advocacy organizations. And so we started to uh, promote this, that this was out there. and. Um, and uh, there were a number of posts on social media sites that uh, seemed to uh, feel like a, either a, a randomized controlled trial was not necessary uh, or that uh, they, would not, they were not interested in participating in a trial like this. Um, and I have to say that the CSF group uh, was fantastic in helping us to address this. Um, they uh, first of all notified us that this was going on and then helped us to address it by um, in, uh, in, a, in a number of different ways. So we created a, a patient education video um, to, about participating in a uh, clinical trial. Uh, there was a video of me describing the trial uh, and, uh, and a number of other posts and all these helped to, um, I would say, satisfy people that this was worthwhile uh, and also to understand that this was not a scary thing. This was just um, a, a trial that was necessary. And, and now I would say we hear very, in fact, I don't think we've had any negative comments, uh, uh, but uh, the, what's even more exciting is that with the support of our partners, uh, that, um, that pe people are really interested in being part of finding the answer to this really important question. And that, that's the most important thing, is that I think that everyone who participates in this trial from the patient's uh, standpoint, they really feel like they are part of a, a, a greater movement to, to find out an answer that's important to them and for future generations of patients. 
Uh, so here's just a, uh, a vid an example of a video that was posted uh, of me talking about the clinical trial. So uh, over time, uh, our enrollment, and I'll show some of the enrollment, but our enrollment really has increased over time. Um, and it has ebbed, and, it sort of ebbs and flows. Uh, and uh, at times where it has ebbed a little bit, uh, we have stood back and, uh, and met with PCORI. In fact, in November at our investigator meeting, we had a large, me a long meeting with PCORI, uh, with um, Caitlin and Dorothy, with uh, various other patient partners. and. Uh, we talked about how we could increase our enrollment, and and this is the part I was so so impressed about is that um, that CSF as an organization really stepped up and provided us with everything that that we need or everything they could do to help with this trial. Um, so here's an example of that. They uh, helped to create this brochure, uh, which was uh, held up by our IRB, um, and I think we have some resolution about this, uh, but. Um, but this really nice brochure to put in clinic offices of the sites that are participating so patients can see this and why it's more from a patient point of view why this is important. Um, and this is the other side of it. It's a trifold. Um, and it, it really, I, I love the, the, the tagline, which is finding a better way together. So this is an example of how CSF has really uh, helped to support this clinical trial and has been an excellent partner. Uh, also, we, uh, as some of you know, we've uh, uh, formed a St. Louis chapter of the Chiari and Syringomyelia Foundation. This tends to be a very active uh, chapter with um, a broad membership, and we uh, meet twice a year, and um, uh, we talk about not just the trial, but uh, we will have a lecturer come in and talk about some sort of uh, aspect of um, uh, care of the patient or living with Chiari and Syringomyelia that's important to our patients. Uh, and so, for example, we brought uh, uh, a pain anesthesiologist in, we've had a neuropsychologist in, and, and various other uh, really quality of life um, uh, experts in to, to talk and, and uh, help us both in our community group uh, and also to inform how we conduct the clinical trial. Uh, other engagement activities, uh, these think tank meetings, I think are really critically important because I get a lot of feedback from all of you about how it's going either at your individual sites or where you see the direction of this going. Um, I managed to get all sorts of expertise uh, sort of downloaded to me uh, all in one go here. Uh, we meet twice a year, as you all know. Um, and then uh, I do attend the um, annual meeting of ASAP as well, and then we have community advisory board meetings both at Vanderbilt and St. Louis, as I mentioned, uh, and we have attended, Dorothy and I gave an, a, a talk together at the Corey's National Meeting in 2016, and again, I thought that was a really nice, um, uh, just a, a nice uh, talk, but also more a nod to what we're doing together as a team. Um, and then we have an annual investigator meeting, as I mentioned. Now, how have we been increasing our enrollment? Um, well, we have implemented coordinator calls on a, on a um, regular basis. We now have site PI calls, and thanks for everybody who's been on, on these calls with me. Uh, and I try to send frequent updates um, via email. Uh, many of you may have received one yesterday from our new trial coordinator, Tonda Meehan. Um, and then uh, I uh, initiated this t-shirt rally, which um, I, I know, again, many of you in the room already know, uh, for certain milestones in recruitment, I've been uh, sending a vintage rock t-shirts of my choice, not yours. Uh -huh. that's, that's the key. Is I, and I, I really do. I spend, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time trying to suit the t-shirt to the person. I'll, I, try to, I try to find their CV online or what they've done or where they're from. or Anyway, I really work hard on that. So. <laughs> Um, so uh, another um, tip that I actually took home from, from this group was uh, from Ed, Ed Benzel, uh, who uh, recently completed a randomized control trial in spine surgery. Uh, and um, uh, his group had used the, an expert panel, an equi equipoise panel. And the rationale behind the equipoise panel uh, is that really 
uh, your recruitment is always going to be uh, limited because of a couple of different things. Number one uh, is that there is surgeon procedural bias. Surgeons really have a preference generally of doing it one way or another. Uh, and then there may also be a patient bias where they've read or uh, have understood or have heard that one is better than the other without really understanding that we really don't know which is better. Uh, so an expert panel can really achieve both goals of reassure surgeons that they're following reasonable clinical practice and that they're not out on a limb, and then also reassure patients that enrolling in the trial is reasonable based on their specific films and their specific case. Uh, so um, this expert panel or equipoise panel is uh, just coming online. It's in the final stages of IRB approval, and uh, in, at least in... Um, and Dr. Benzel's experience, uh, they published that their recruitment rate after initiating an expert panel went from 40% to 81%, which is really a dramatic increase. So we were really uh, interested in, in starting this. Now, this uh, slide is just to, to show you, without reading uh, every word, um, the different strategies that we're doing to sort of um, uh, encourage en enrollment across our uh, 41 sites. and. Uh, the, one, the reason I showed this is the ones in red are really ones that uh, CSF took the lead on. And uh, if you really think about this, uh, enrollment really can be viewed from a, a couple of different ways. One is from the patient's perspective, and that's hard for us as investigators and clinicians and surgeons to really understand. And, and I would say that that is the perfect role for an organization like CSF to help uh, to disseminate information that is from a patient's perspective. Um, they uh, came all the way out to St. Louis and helped uh, to record some videos uh, to help um, reassure patients and get a personal perspective on contributing to the trial. Um, so really it's been a fantastic partnership. And so this is uh, a screening log from November. Uh, at this point we'd screened 429 patients and enrolled 73. Uh, and you can see why they didn't, uh, they didn't get enrolled. Most of them are imaging fails. So that's that their syrinx is either too small or too big, or maybe they had their uh, tonsillar ectopia was um, three millimeters. Uh, but those would be imaging uh, fails, uh, whether they had a previous decompression or uh, whether surgery wasn't offered. In other words, if somebody's perfectly well and the surgeon says, well, you know, I, I think that while surgery might be reasonable here, that it's also reasonable to just see how you do for a period of time. Um, but these th three numbers here are important because that's the faucet, right? How many patients who were screened. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, whether family declined participation, which is always okay, uh, or if somebody got their non-allocated surgery. And so we've been really looking at these numbers a little bit and um, sort of making sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that people reassured that this is uh, um, a good option to participate in this trial. And so we've coordinator calls and our trial updates and uh, emails and our uh, a red cat based screening tool. Uh, we're providing individual sites with consort diagrams which are really individual site based um, metrics in terms of how many are, are screened and enrolled and why they weren't enrolled. Um, and then CSF has helped us with uh, family interest in participating uh, and then uh, in terms of non-allocated surgery sometimes that's up to the surgeon uh, and so we've uh, Im implemented this expert panel to reassure surgeons that in uh, patients that are eligible that either procedure is reasonable. And here's our enrollment. Um, you can see we actually uh, just tipped beyond this. Uh, this was at the end of March uh, 31st. And our total, uh, we recently did a sample size recalculation based on the variability the intra-class coefficient among different sites, and our sample size is 148, and we are just in the process of finalizing that re sample size recalculation and enrollment end date with, um, with PCORI. In fact, I received an email here in the room here um, that we're at the very last uh, part of this. So, um, so we're at 112 patients as of today. Um, and, uh, and we have 148 total, so we're making really good progress right now. And you can see that the, the, the increase in rate of enrollment over time, which is, I think, uh, results from everything everybody in the room has been doing, and especially um, our partners here at CSF. Um, the last thing I want to mention is uh, uh, 
not related to the PFD trial really at all, but a uh, second uh, research effort that we're doing. And, and Gabe Haller, who's in the back, is going to really talk about this. So I'm not going to mention too much about it other than to say that we've with uh, Doug Brockmeyer uh, formed a, a multi-institutional group to be able to understand and study uh, the genetic etiologies of Chiari and Syringomyelia, and you'll be hearing more about this here momentarily. Uh, so that's it. I just want to say thanks again, and I'm happy to answer any questions now here or you know, afterwards offline.